So good morning and welcome to the webinar presentation, The Amazing Honey Bee. My name is Lori George and I am a local food small farms educator with University of Illinois Extension located in the Mount Vernon area. Our presenter today is James Theory, who is one of my coworkers on the local food small farms team. And he serves Grundy, Kankakee and Will counties. Also joining us is Maggie Watcher, who is a master beekeeper at Urbana, Illinois. She is a beekeeping mentor and has helped many people in the community to start beekeeping. She teaches classes in all aspects of beekeeping at Parkland Community College. Her honey and mead have won many awards in honey judging competitions. She has spoken in various forums about honey judging, adding value to honey and marketing. Maggie has a Facebook site called Second Nature Honey. Welcome James and Maggie. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Rolly. Yes. So, okay, I'll lead the discussion here, the presentation, and Maggie will be. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Yes, yeah. yes. And I'll start off by telling you that I have a very, a picture that, that was sent to me two days ago that you see on the screen right there. Uh, this lady captured this honeybee. Outside her house, you know, you recognize that as a crab apple bloom, and you can see that bee is carrying a whole lot of pollen on her hind leg there. And for me, this was a phenomenal picture, and I appreciate it. And I thought I would share this with you. Great picture. Look out for these honeybees and take pictures and share with other people. We appreciate this. So today we'll be talking about the amazing honeybee, quite, enough, quite a few things about it. Um, Rory will send out uh, the PowerPoint in PDF form so that you can follow along. And you can ask questions by putting them in the chat box and we will answer as best as we can at the end of the presentation. So um, let's begin. So what's a honeybee? And I asked this question not to insult anyone. Everybody knows what a honeybee is. But working in extension office, You're fine. you'll be amazed by the number of people that come with questions or call us to say they have honeybees outside their house. For instance, when you see the nest at the bottom left hand picture there in your tree, has nothing to do with the bees, but it is not once or twice or thrice I've been caught by people saying I have a honeybee nest in a tree outside my house. It, that's made by a bald faced hornet that you see right next to it over there. And it's not a bee. And on, on the other cartoon there, you can tell, you can see there are other forms of insects that look like bees, but are not really bees except then for the bottom right hand one, which is a honeybee, the Apis merifera, and the, right, the bottom right hand corner there, which is a bumblebee. Both, well, at least a bumblebee, you can see the pollen in its hind leg there. So what's a honeybee? It's a wasp-like insect. It's not a wasp, but right alone we'll be talking about it having evolved from a wasp. So it's wasp-like, not quite like, quite like a wasp. And it is one of 400 plus bee species in the United States. And Apis merifera is Greek, I believe, which means to carry honey. That's what Apis merifera stands for. And that's what a bee is, basically. And in nature, we have creatures that are clever or co-evolve with the other creatures to mimic them. So the hoverflies, which you see a picture of there, is harmless in terms of it doesn't sting. But it has taken on the appearance of a bee, one, so that it can frighten humans, two, it will uh, scare away any predators that fear bees. 
So that aspect of mimicry is what I was bringing in here. And again, just to tell you that there are many lookalikes of bees that we often mistake here. What's our interest in honeybees? They are pollinators. And you very well know that they carry pollen from one plant to the next. Picture of a bee over there carrying pollen on its hind leg. But beyond that, the hairs that you see on that bee have a charge that attracts pollen particles. And when it moves from flower to flower, it pollinates passively without even realizing it's doing it, but it pollinates the flowers. So they are, they are valuable pollinators. And yes, we wouldn't have almonds if we didn't have bees and many other crops. And we'll talk about that in a second. If you keep bees, you always have a sweet reward. You have honey, which then we'll talk about in, in, a, few, in a little more detail later on. It's a hobby and it is therapeutic for some people. There are people who talk to bees and find it just a therapy of sorts. So again, it helps that way. Can you make some dollars? Yes. Not always. There are beekeepers who say if you really are after making a whole lot of money from keeping bees, you better invest your money in stocks. <laughs> it's a connection with the real world. Bees will teach you a whole lot. And yes, you get to know about, you get to botanize, you get to know about plants, you get to know about the weather, you get to know about the uh, process of making honey. So you get connected with the real world. It's in an easier livestock. Actually, the Illinois Department of Agriculture considers bees as livestock. And um, it's easier because you don't need masses of space for it. The care that you take for them is on and off, not, all, not every day thing. So it's an easier livestock to keep. Jim, a, James, uh, could I just say something? Yes, please, please. That, um, I think a lot of people try um, uh, keeping bees because they think they're going to make money from selling the honey but a lot of unexpected things can happen. Uh, if you have a drought or if you have lots of rain or um, if the winter was particularly hard, you can find yourself um, having invested in beekeeping and um, not really having it pay off. What uh, what I say, uh, I tell people, is that I think the best, most um, economically feasible um, way of keeping bees is to include them in a larger farm plan. In other words, if you have orchards and you're looking for pollinators, keeping bees will pay off in terms of a greater, healthier fruit, uh, fruit production. Uh, it, I think keeping bees works best when you combine it with um, farm into the general farm production. If you want to make millions or you want to make a whole lot of money, then you have to consider pollination. And that means um, uh, taking your bees and many bees from one part of the U.S. to another to follow the crops. That's how beekeepers today make money. And they do it generally at the expense of the bees because moving bees for the bee is very stressful. Bees live in trees in nature and trees don't move. Bees communicate through movement, through touch. That's one of their ways, they have several, but touch is important. And when they're riding on the back of a truck, bumping up and down, it's very hard for them 
to to communicate with each other and this is what um this is what's stressful and it reduces their immunity when they um, arrive in the fields where the crops are and they mingle with other bees and then they can um, pick up illnesses very quickly so keeping bees is um and making it financially viable is uh something that requires expertise and also um you have to understand how the honeybee works and what what your um what your goals are if your goals are to improve your crops on a farm you have a different way of handling bees than if you're taking them to california to pollinate the almonds thanks thank you yes and so yeah you become a hero if you are handling bees now that people people are scared of bees so if you're handling bees you are a hero and yes if you have lots of honey and give to your neighbor then you make friends and still we want to make others think we are crazy but that's not really what it is reasons why you should not keep bees you're not going to get rich quick that has been well uh, explained um you don't care for physical work those hive bodies and we'll talk about them again in a second they can be heavy now if you don't want to lift those there are alternatives you could get into um, to not lift those to still keep bees but not lift those heavy hive bodies and that's a subject for maybe another talk and there are people who really really hate to get stung and will excuse anybody who has allergy but otherwise getting stung by a bee most of us have been stung by a bee inadvertently just walking in the lawn you step on a bee that was on a clover i mean it's it's normal to get stung what's not normal and likable is when you have allergy not very many people are hyper allergic allergies have various degrees and some when it gets to the hyper allergic level that would be worrisome and we'll talk about that in a second too but if you want to think you are not crazy then don't keep bees <laughs> bees pollinate 30 plus percent of the foods we eat and indeed einstein was one who said if we don't have bees we don't have food he was very worried about the plight of bees during his time and very many other people say without bees if we're going to lose 30 percent of the foods we eat then that's not good for us there's no food security there if you want to know more about bees if you're scared dead scared of them uh, check out this movie the secret life of bees and it will teach you to not be afraid no life loving bee wants to sting you when you handle bees you have to wear long sleeves and pants of course um, don't even think about swatting the bee if it comes around you because once you start doing that you're in for a fight same thing even with the sweat bees if it lands on your skin it's after the salt in the sweat just let it take some and it will go on you start swatting it you know you're inviting it to a fight talk to the bees maggie was she's the one that has told me when she gets to her bee hives she starts by talking to them good morning <laughs> and we are here because we both have an interest in each other let's all be calm and other beekeepers have told me when they get to their beekeep their beehives they'll hang around for a minute or two by the entrance for the bees to get used to them and you move slowly no no hurry and i just added something there think about it if bees will only sting you for self-defense purposes because why would a bee end 
uh, end its life. When they sting you, it's a dead end for them. Why would they just want to commit suicide? There's really no reason for them to do that. So treat them nice, they'll treat you, they'll treat you good as well. Yeah, you just want to be sure to, to know that wasps have a different kind of stinger and they can sting you over and over. They don't die when they sting you. It's a smooth stinger. And the bees have a barb on the end. So when they sting you, it stays in your skin and it pulls out of the bee and kills her. So um, if you're around a wasp, I would say just move away. If you're around a bee, move slowly and try not to do anything that the bee might consider threatening, like swatting. <laughs> so back to the allergies and anaphylaxis is an effect on the resp resp respiratory system. And if you get the handout, you can read this for yourself. Um, if you know or suspect to be one of the hyperallergic or uh, people, you need to be on, on your guard. There are antihistamines or medications you can carry around with you or keep in your home. If you have other allergies like asthma, asthma then you need to be just be careful. And the next slide also tells you to remember that Anaphylaxis can be life-threatening, and um, just be careful. Anything else, Maggie? Well, I know a couple of beekeepers who had to leave beekeeping because they developed anaphylaxis. Just because you're stung once and you don't have a reaction doesn't mean that you won't have a reaction uh, over time. The research shows that um, people who have been stung less than 10 times or more than 100 and don't have a reaction are likely not to have a reaction. I've been stung oh, many more, <laughs> probably hundreds, if not thousands of times. Um, but I kept track of it for the first hundred stings. I counted them uh, because I wanted to make sure that I would be um, outside. I, I would not be in the anaphylaxis group. Um, it takes a little time for your body to build up its reaction to a sting. And every time you're stung, if you're, if you're, leaning toward anaphylaxis, you're more likely to uh, react. So uh, just because you're stung once or twice and you don't have a reaction doesn't mean you won't develop a reaction. Okay. So honeybees or bees in general have been around since the age of the dinosaurs, and I want to say 60 million years plus. And they have co-evolved with the flowers. So flowers appeared around that time. Um, and, and bees, there's another cartoon down there, bees evolved themselves, evolved from wasps. Now wasps are carnivorous, but with the appearance of flowers that have plenty of nectar and pollen to eat, the bees just became herbivores. And just so to let you know how bees evolved. Yeah. Where do honeybees live in nature? Honeybees are cavity nesters. They dwell in cavities. And humans, we have that. What you see there is a cartoon of <clears throat> a, bit, <clears throat> a cavity in a tree. <clears throat> a cavity in a tree. 
And because we have studied how they organize themselves in the cavity, we've been able to make efficient and effective hives for them to stay in. And what you note here is that this cavity would be dark inside, they like the darkness. And then they have a very small entryway. When it is that small, it's defensible. And then it has adequate volume. It can't just be in a small hole because they need to have space for the brood. The brood are the young ones, they're developing larvae and the eggs. And they need to have a pantry, a storage for honey as well as ne nectar, those two, and pollen. So um, they also have a separation of where the brood is and where the storage is. And that, those things have been studied very well by humans. That's how we are able to have made the hive, which we'll talk about in a minute. But they will also choose to live where flowers are abundant, and i give some examples there. They also like to live in cliffs, in Asia especially. They've been found to live quite a bit in, in, in holes, in cavities, in the cliffs. And we have domesticated them ourselves and built them hives. Now, another thing, and somebody asked a question with regard to bees swarming. And about this time of the year, normal year, swarming takes place. And a swarm is just a group of bees moving out of the hive to go find a new home. That's exactly what swarming is. And with the queen. With, with the, the queen. queen. Yes, yes. And I was, I was going to say, why do they swarm? First of all, just by when the queen decides she wants to have a new home, she will take off and about half the colony, the royal subjects will follow her and she will go out and make a new home, which means the colony has split into two. So it's, that's a method of natural multiplication. On the other hand, if the queen senses that this home is too small for so many of us, then she will take off with half, she'll give the right message and half of the population approximately will follow her. And yet, and still, an, an aging queen who feels that maybe soon the workers will start sensing that I'm old now and I'm not laying eggs as I should, takes off. Again, she'll take off with quite a number of those. And she will get tired flying out there and the next object she finds is where she will land on. She could land on the ground, she could land on your car. She, they've been found underneath uh, park benches, or she could just find a little twig and, and patch on there. And then a whole retinue of her royal subjects will be surrounding her. And we get calls in extension office and beekeepers get calls all the time, you know, come and get these bees out of my yard. The kids are playing and I don't want them here. Swarms are just resting for a little bit while scouts go out and look for a possible nesting place. So you leave them alone a day or two, the queen will be happy to move on. They'll move on. Or you can call a beekeeper. And in Ag and extension offices, we do have names of beekeepers that we can then inform that there are some bees to pick up somewhere. And I have a cartoon here of a swarm that was in Kankakee area. Here in 2011, low enough that when a beekeeper was called, he was just able to reach and cut out the little twig from which they were hanging from. And of course, he'd brought a box into which he was able to load them into and they found a new home. So he was to take them home and put them in the bigger hive once they get settled. Now you notice that he's not dressed up. One, he's handling these bees with care, extreme caution, you know, she, he's not moving very fast and all that. 
and he's also experienced. So that's, those are two things. And this was a prize catch. One, he didn't need a ladder to go out and get them. And he may have saved himself $150 just getting a queen colony right there. And so that's, that's about it with Swarm, but we'll get back to it towards the end of the talk. So we humans have studied how bees live. And in 1896, a man called Langstroth came up with a hive that we, today we call Langstroth hive. <laughs> And the picture you see on the left hand side there is of a hive showing two boxes, a bottom board there, and a little bit of a piece of wood there that is used for the hive entrance to either make it bigger or smaller, and we talk about that. And there are two covers there that protect the hive from the elements. And it's more diagrammatic here, uh, where you see the deep super, I can use the right there this is the deep super right here and that's where we want the queen most of the time to stay and lay her eggs meanwhile upstairs we'll have a shallow super and right here and because we don't want the, the queen to go there we use an excluder right there which has holes which will allow workers to go up to the super and uh, store honey there we don't want the queen coming up there to lay eggs because then our honey will be contaminated with, 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 with the larvae form, larval forms. And then those outer covers protecting from the elements, the weather elements, and at the same time allowing for ventilation. Ventilation is critical in this hive. It's dark inside. There are frames inside there that are vertically hanging in there where the bees build comb into which they either have eggs laid or pollen, nectar, and honey stored. So who lives in the hive? Let's talk about who lives in the hive. There are three uh, castes in the colony, the queen, the worker, and the drone. The queen is only one, and you can't have two because they'll fight to the death. And she's the one who directs the activities that happen in the hive. And as you can see from the picture, she's the biggest. She's a massive egg layer. And on a good day, she will be laying up to 2,000 eggs. What's a good day, good time? Good time would be when there's plentiful food. The weather is just right and there's lots of nectar flowing out there. And she will lay a whole lot of eggs. That's the queen. A queenless colony is not functional. As soon as a queen is lost, for whatever reason, the workers make haste to make a new queen. Who else lives in the hive? It's the workers. And the workers are called workers because they work, work, and do more work. They do everything in the hive. Um, she's the smallest, but she is the hardest working. <clears throat> All of them are girls, of course. <clears throat> they forage for food, they clean the house, and they feed everyone. This thing is moving itself. And they guard and keep the colony warm. And they're the hardest working. Let me just put it out, out that way. And then the drones. The drones are, as you can see there, um, the boys. Their job is only one to mate with the queen and not with the queen that you see in the picture there. It's, it's with the queen from another colony because this queen in the same colony would be their mother. So they're not going to mate with the mother. They're going to go out and look, see if there's another queen out there. They are big eyes, as you can see there. That's because when they fly, they go on a mating flight. It's helpful for them to be able to see where the queen is. And when she goes on a mating flight, up, she'll mate with up to 30 males. And you will agree with me, she's well mated at that point. And she's able to store that. She has a spam bank. That will be uh, in storage for the next three, four years if she lives that long. 
most of the queens and how we use them these days are only around for two to three years at most. And I don't know if you're going to ask, so what do they do the rest of the time? If the queen only mates once in so many years. What are the drones doing there? Um, drinking beer and watching TV. And then um, come winter time, because the bee, the worker bees have to keep the colony warm, come winter time, the drones are thrown out, you know, into the cold too much for the worker bees to be uh, making heat for people who are lazy, who are not doing anything in the hive. However, as we shall see later, the drones sometimes help in fanning the honey to, fanning the nectar to make honey, and we'll talk about that later. And I might just add the girls love to see the boys anyway, no matter what. Okay, the honeybee life cycle, uh, there's a diagram here showing. The queen is the one that's on the left side of that cartoon. And she will not lay an egg in a cell that has not been cleaned up by the workers. So she lays the egg and that egg is standing upright on its end. If you find eggs that are not upright on their ends and you find maybe more than one, like two or three, one of the workers is laying eggs for whatever reason. But if the queen bee is doing it, that egg is one in the cell and it's upright. And it hatches in about three days to a larval form. And uh, you, can, you can follow the cartoon on the right hand side. Day three, all types of eggs hatch. The drone, and the worker and the queen all hatch at the same time. I should have said that the drone is haploid. For those of you that are into genetics, haploid just means she has one set of chromosomes from mom only. And that's, that means when the queen decided she was going to make a drone, she did not fertilize that egg. She doesn't want a worker, she wants a drone. So she doesn't fertilize the egg. She only ha it only has her genes, her chromosomes. So you can rightly say the drone has no father. It has a mother, but it has both grandfather and grandmother. And I hope that doesn't confuse you. But the queen develops fastest. If you look at the, the extreme right hand co uh, column there, the queen develops fastest. In 16 days you have a queen, the worker follows in about 21 days, and the drone takes forever to come out, 24 days. And once the worker bee comes out of the cell, as you see it coming out, the first job is to clean the house, to clean where she just came from. They are on the job immediately. When they are young, they work in the house, then they graduate later on to become foragers in their life, uh, for the rest of their life. Back to the worker bee and the foraging duty, because this is a big one. She will travel up to three miles, two miles, three miles to forage. She sucks nectar out of flowers into a special stomach and also collects pollen. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the job she does. Once she does that, and then she comes back to the house, and once she comes back to the hive, she's met at the door or somewhere near the door, and the, the, the housekeeping bees pick up the nectar from her, from her. And you can see the exchange taking place um, from the foraging bee to the housekeeping bee, right here, right there, okay? And once that happens, the foraging bee goes back for more uh, nectar and pollen, whereas the in-hive worker bee starts to digest the nectar. Now, nectar is the same as sucrose, same as the table sugar that you use in the house. And with the enzymes that she has, she breaks down that complex sugar sucrose 
into simple sugars, glucose and fructose. And that's why honey tastes much better. James, I have, I have to interrupt you, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The um, honey is not just like sucrose. Honey, for one thing, is broken down into glucose and sucrose. It's not just sucrose. And it um, contains enzymes that are beneficial to human health that come from the bee. Every time the bee um, uh, um, sucks nectar into that honey stomach, she adds enzymes into it. And so um, when she spits it up so the other bee can take it into the hive, that bee also adds enzymes. And so it's, it's much more nutritious and it's easier to digest than regular sugar. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the correction there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can see the process that then taking place in processing the nectar into honey. And when uh, the, the nectar comes into the hive, it's 85% water. And once it, when, when it gets digested, it is regurgitated by the bees and chewed and passed from bee to bee. And also it's fanned at the same time so that uh, uh, water can evaporate from that serum. That's why when water is reduced from 85 to 18%, the serum becomes thick and viscous. Into, this, the sub, into the product we know as honey. And so, honey is the world's first processed food. We only, humans, we only started processing our food maybe two million years ago. The bees have been doing it for more than 60 million years. This is the world's first processed food. And once the honey is at 18% water content, it is stored in honeycomb cells for a few days and it is found some more, just in case it's got more water, it's found some more. Once it's at the right water content, the cells are cut in, in, in that completed uh, uh, produce. And that's what you see there. Uh, here you can see cupped cells at the top there, the white wax. And these are the cells down here in the middle. Honey is just being added. And at the bottom, you still have some empty cells. Why do bees make honey? They make honey for their own food. And especially here in the temperate countries where we have winter, it's really their reserves for food for the winter. And with their energy intensive lifestyle, they need this very nutritious product to keep them going. It's also used as food for the brood, for the younger workers, for the developing uh, bees that have not left the hive yet. They need food as well. In winter, the job of keeping the hive warm is tremendous. They have to shiver, they have to shiver to produce heat. That is very energy intensive right there. So they need a whole lot of food. And it stimulates the production of wax. And especially when you have, you have them in a dark area, the wax production is stimulated even more. So for all these reasons, bees make honey. And bees do a whole lot of work. They say one bee makes approximately enough honey to just to fit in a teaspoon in its lifetime. So thousands of bees are needed to make even one pound of honey. And lots of flowers and lots of traveling, as you can see in this cartoon uh, here. It's a lot of work to just make one pound. 
human food, on the other hand, uh, has not been, and I think I made this point, we only started processing our food very, very recently. And bees have been around for 60 million years plus. But then the question I've had is, what's better, sugar or honey? And this cartoon is showing, or this diagram is showing that. When it comes to calories between sugar and honey, it's really not a whole lot of difference. When it comes to the state of both uh, products, sucrose or sugar is in the sucrose form, the complex sugar, whereas honey, the bees have already done the job of breaking it down into the simple sugars, glucose and fructose. So we are not spending as much energy then uh, breaking it down. When it comes to nutrients in sugar, if there is any, I'm not so sure what, gives us energy, but that's it. When it comes to honey, you have more than sugar, more than in sugar, and we'll see that in the next cartoon, I think, that slide. And then sugar could be a problem having because of uh, health disorders, whereas some honeys, as, as the one shown there from a, a tree known as Manuka, which is out of New Zealand, it's supposedly very medicinal. And actually a few studies have shown that um, honey can be medicinal in itself. You can, if you apply to a wound, it dries up, heals up faster. And that has been shown uh, research, by, through research. The components of honey then are many, starting with water, and it's an average of 18, 17, 18 percent. You have the sugars over there. Uh, you have proteins, you have vitamins. You have essential minerals as well. And antioxidants, the anti-aging agents. And you have some essential oils. So when it comes to sugar versus honey, you definitely are getting quite a few more um, advantages using honey. There are very many honey brands out there, more than 1100 at the time this was published, which is a few years back. There may be more right now. But you see on the right hand there saying uh, honey without pollen. Why would somebody want honey to be without its pollen, which Pollen is removed by people who are being malicious. If you've been adulterating honey, if you've been getting honey and, you know, say one part and adding four parts of corn syrup and calling that honey, that's adulteration. And researchers in Texas, A&M University, have found a way of fingerprinting or typing different types of pollen. So if there's pollen from China, pollen from India, from Europe, from Texas or from Illinois, they can tell exactly where honey came from using the pollen that is uh, in it. So some honeys have been adulterated quite a bit. Beware when you find very cheap honeys out in the stores because you could be just as well be uh, buying corn syrup. It's not a whole lot of honey in it. And that's where your local beekeepers come in because they don't mess around like that. And once you get to know them, you know what kind of honeys you're buying. Talking about keeping bees. After 1945, after the end of the World War, beekeeping became a big uh, activity in the United States. And there was close to 6 million um, colonies then. And today we're talking about less than 3 million colonies and counting on the disappearance of colonies, still disappearing. Um, with the, with the, after 1945, after the end of the war, scientists started coming up with a lot of technologies, among them pesticides. And those pesticides were not 
used with people and wildlife in mind. So there was destruction of very many colonies. Added to that, in 1982, we had the parasitic mites that were introduced into the US, and those took a further toll on the bee colonies, as you can see in the slide here. And then in, in 2007, a new phenomenon where bees or bee colonies just died or disappeared, took off and never came back. The colony collapse disorder. And whenever we talk, we call something a disorder, we don't understand what is causing that. Although now some studies have shown that a few factors, including disease and pesticides and the mites, or could be, and the stresses, uh, Maggie talked about the stress of transport, all those stresses could be causing bees to go and never return. And so, Studies are still continuing as to why bees are disappearing. Of course, and we shall talk about this, we are also messing with the environment. What foraging area is getting less and less with time because we are opening up new areas for farmland as well as development. That's taking away their foraging habitats. And so, again, just to recap, we, we humans have destroyed bees quite a bit through the use of pesticides and that has been shown through research now. Neonicotinoids that are coated on seed, so that's, you know, corn and soybean seed, so that when they germinate, the cutworms get killed if they try to mm, eat, you know, the, the newly germinating crops. Those Neonicotinoids are dust which blows up in the wind, in the dust, and comes on to flowers, the dandelion flowers. And those neonicotinoids are systemic. They move in the plant so that when a bee takes nectar out of that kind of a plant, it's affected. And very little of the neonicotinoid will affect a bee. So we've been responsible quite a bit ourselves. And then the stress in transit, moving bees and knocking them over from the east coast to the west coast to go and pollinate those almonds is stressful by any measure. And then bees have their enemies too. They have their predators, the raccoons and the mice and, and, and other animals, even other insects for that matter. Weather and Whenever we meet at this time of year with beekeepers, maybe January, February, the main question is, did your bees survive? How many of your colonies survived? Because winter is particularly harsh to bees. And particularly harsh if you took all their food and now you have to feed them something else or they starve in, in the process. It's a big, it's a huge toll on the bees. Unbalanced diet, of course, when we feed them corn syrup, I mean sugar and all that, that's not, not what, you remember what is in the honey there. So many nice things. You cannot, it's not possible to get them all in, 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 in the sugar syrup that we feed them over winter. Diseases, they are also living things and diseases do affect them as well as insects. and uh, the varroa mites, and you see that in the picture over here, these varroa mites, if you imagine the palm of your hand on your body, that's the size, that's the relative size or the comparative size of um, varroa mite on the bees. And the varroa mites don't just suck out the hemolymph, they are after the fatty up substances in the bees, and they are able to go in between the, the body segments there and suck out the fat out of the bees. And they know very well to go to the, a place where the bees cannot reach them with their feet or their mouth. That's an, a major issue right now. It's the number one problem that we are having with bees. 
at present, and so many colonies are getting destroyed by Varroa mites. And then pollinators are a valuable natural resource, no question about it. When it comes to botany, we do know that from the pollination that the bees do, there has been genetic mix-ups out there and I'm sure there have been new varieties, new species of plants that have come up as a result of pollination by bees. So in addition to the fact that in addition to the fact that the bees are pollinating 30% of the foods we eat, uh, they are also responsible for the diversity of plants that are out there and would help if we didn't keep on invading their habitats or if we could at least do something to help them out when it comes to habitats. And so if we have to keep the diversity of bee species in the United States, we have to be conscious of how to conserve them. We have to support efforts to preserve the environment. And if you must mow, and this is what I tell people myself, if you have a quarter acre that you have grass on, or you have a yard, why don't you leave a quarter of that quarter unmowed so that natural vegetation grows out there and you can have butterflies and bees of various species coming out there to forage. Outside our extension office, we have a mint plant. And that mint plant, the only reason I don't destroy it is because it blooms very late when there are very few other plants blooming. And I go out there and I can count up to 20 species of insects, one of them being honeybee, foraging on the, on the, on the nectar and the pollen there. So anything little that you can do, planting bee-friendly flowers, um, get to be friends with your uh, local natural resource conservation service office. That's a USDA office. They give out free seeds, seeds of native plants that are mixed in a packet that you can put out in your yard or somewhere, maybe community garden. Uh, that will help the bees uh, quite a bit. And lastly, if you know where your honey comes from, you'll be supporting a local beekeeper. You'll be helping them to uh, keep, keep bees more. You'll, you'll encourage them to keep bees. So conservation efforts are going around all over the place. And I have a few cartoons there just indicating that. That's exactly the point I made. NRCS up there, and many not-for-profit organizations that are actually into um, conservation of the bees. See Bumblebee Conservation Trust, bottom left there, it's a 501c3 organization in the, in the United Kingdom. There are questions, there are questions always being asked, you know, what do I need to do to become a new beekeeper? Um, others go beyond that and say, what does it cost me to become a beekeeper? First of all, find out if where you want to keep your bee has any restrictions. Are there zoning laws? Uh, maybe you want to do this in your backyard. Find out first. Or even in other areas, check to see that you're not infringing on the laws of that county or that uh, township or locality. But basically, if you're to start beekeeping, I've shown a few things, items here. You need a hive. And then you need the personal protection equipment, which is the bee suit you're seeing there and the gloves and shoes. You need shoes and the, and the hat, which has a screen around it. On the right hand side there, which is the same thing that the man is holding, is a smoking <clears throat> <coughs> smoking, um, a smoker, we call it a smoker. When you want to calm the bees, you come out with this thing um, and you puff a few smoke, smoke, uh, smoke puffs at the entrance of the beehive as well as the top. 
and the bees calm down. The physiology is given a different signal altogether by the smoke. Some people say the bees think that the house is on fire, so that's not the time to be fighting in one, it's a time to be thinking about the brood and thinking about the house. So with that, you can calm them and you can walk around them without too much of a fuss from the bees. The, the hive tool right here, this one right here, and the one that this man is also holding, helps you to separate the frames from each other because they are usually stuck to either themselves, each other, or to the box itself. So to lift them out, you need this item. You also need the, the comb right here, which is this one right here. When you want to uncap the frames when they have the wax, you need to uncap them. So this helps. The brush, that's helpful when you have a lot of bees on the frame and you just want to gently remove them away. It's a very soft comb. You just want to gently remove them away. It helps a lot. All said, between maybe $600 can get you started with the basic equipment. That's my estimate can spend more, of course, to buy more things. You don't need an extractor at this point in time for honey. You can borrow some, one from another beekeeper, but you don't need it right, right away. When you begin, these are your basics. Those of you that are, have been keeping bees, uh, you will know what I mean by when that the colony has resumed the life about, right about now. April had some mild days, 60, 65 degrees Fahrenheit days, and the bees became active, some flowers bloomed, and then Mother Nature changed her mind and we had winter-like temperatures the last week. So there wasn't a whole lot of nectar being produced by the plants because their, their, resp their metabolism got arrested by the cold weather. But those of you that have a little experience, one of these days when it is over 55 degrees Fahrenheit, which we are getting into, you can start inspecting the hive. What's happening there? Do you have drone? Do you have a brood going? Do you have stores of food? Do you have a queen who is performing? So that I'll leave until later if, if anybody has another question, a further question. You can teach yourself a whole lot. The internet can be a source of information, but be careful. More likely than not, choose those, um, choose sites where you see EDU because that's probably a university. Or choose where you see beekeeping associations, the Illinois State Beekeeping Association or the Ohio State Beekeeping Association, those types of websites will give you good information. The Beekeeping for Dummies is a, is a simple book to read. Check out documentaries and movies uh, that are shown there. Become a member of a beekeeping association. I think people tell me they learn best when they attend the meetings with associate, in associations because they can ask any question, they can get mentors, they can discuss freely. And then webinars and for, for instance, um, at the very bottom there on May 24th, which is another 10 days from now, there will be a webinar on alcohol wash, which is a method of estimating the number of varroa mites in a, in a, in a colony. It's not very much liked because Alcohol means you have killed so many bees and out of those 300 bees, you are checking to see if you have less than or 1%, 1, 1% uh, varroa mites. That's why you are checking. What's the number of varroa mites in there? But there are alternatives. Anyhow, it helps if you can register. I've given you the website there. If you register, you will not only see what they say about alcohol wash, 
you also get to know how to do inspections. When you open a hive to do inspections, what are you looking for? How do you do it? Uh, how do you use a smoker? Uh, what kinds of things do you look for? And then I just went into the, the, the I went into the internet and found quite a number of resources you can use to educate yourself. The second one you see there, MSU, Michigan State University. Um, the fourth one there, ohiostateuniversity.edu. So get, there's lots of good information out there. Although we still say be careful, some people will say some controversial things, but generally speaking, if you go with the EDU, the EDU sites, they are pretty good. Meanwhile, if you have a question, write to me. I don't have all the answers, I know that, but I have people who have lots of answers. And you can also write to Maggie, and that's her email over there. It's easy, maggiewapter at yahoo.com. She'll get back with you within 24 hours, or at most 24 hours. And that kind of wraps up my presentation. But when you registered, you also asked questions. And there were, we got three people asking questions ahead of time. What's a season timeline, possibly month by month, throughout the year? What do you do? And the second one was about mite control. That must be somebody who is already keeping bees. And the supplements for healthy bees, as well as swarm control and prevention. And somebody who is brand new, I guess, said, what are new beekeeping tips? Guidance and local mentoring. And I'll start with the last one. With the new beekeeping tips, starts with you. The traits of a good beekeeper. If you want to be a good beekeeper, you have to be a person who has resilience. Because you're going to lose colonies. And losing, if you start with two and you lose two the first year, doesn't mean you quit. You just learned a whole lot of things. Maybe Mother Nature was very harsh with her winter. And try again. You have to be resilient. You have to be curious. What's going on in the colony? And the curiosity gets you wanting to do more. And once you find out what's going on and you become educated, um, you become encouraged in the process. You also have to be a critical thinker. You have to put pieces together. There's a whole lot of things that are happening and it's a puzzle that you've got to fit with all the different pieces. As a beekeeper, you also need to be one step ahead of bees or try anyways. Whenever we meet in the beekeeper associations, I go to two meetings, uh, two associations every month. The thing beekeepers want to know most is, what should I be doing now? Or what should I be preparing to do in the next week next two weeks, next month, before we meet again. And then you have to be cool-headed. Bees can sense fear. Walk up to them and talk to them. Walk up to them and stand a little bit. Let them get used to you. Let them fly around you. Take, you know, let them just realize that you're not in any way a threat. And then be humble. You can know it all. Mother Nature also has her moments. If she does what she does, just, just take it in pride and stride and accept to ask others. If you figure out what went wrong and you correct it, you just keep going, you just forge ahead. If you have those qualities, then you should be good to go if you haven't started yet. So I came up with a beekeeping calendar and this is really nothing when it comes to the amount of work in some of the months that are in the beekeeping calendar. And as you see, like January, there's very little beekeeper activity. If your bees have enough food and the entrance has no snow, you wanna remove snow from the entrance because bees wanna come out one time, one, one, one time or another when it's a little warmer, to take a bathroom break. They are very hygienic and sanitary. They don't want to do it inside the hive. So 
it's a time also to be educating yourself or if you didn't order your bees and equipment and even if need repair, get yourself ready. And February, nothing. March, especially in our region here, make sure there's enough feed. You don't want these bees to be starving. That's a major issue. And if you're above freezing temperatures, you can remove the winterizing gear. If you, win if you look at the bottom there in, in October, you winterize the hive. You kind of wrapped it with something extra to keep the heat from escaping too much. And also the entrance reducer that was put in September so that the mice, if I was a mouse, I'd want to go in there and live there. It's, it's you got food, it's warm there, the bees, and the bees are not bothered by a mouse that is in there, they are busy making sure that her majesty is at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So they are busy doing other things. So around now, May, you are preventing swarms from happening. Okay, and you see in April there, you can, you can do a splitting of the hive, which means dividing the hive into two, the colony into two. But you prevent the, 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 sw the colony from swarming, as we discussed earlier. The mites, time to check on that. Maybe start doing a hive inspection, and if there is no food, feed them. I just found out that when it gets as you have a snap code like we did the last week, plants stop producing so much of nectar and pollen. So the bees don't wanna go, the bees don't wanna go out anyway, it's too cold to be out there. So it could be a time of starvation. Make sure that you have enough feed. Then come June, <clears throat> there's not lots of nectar now and you can inspect the hive. What's the queen? Is the queen performing properly? In July, is it too hot and you need to increase the ventilation? Do you have water for the bees? Or have they an access, an access to that? And still check out on the swarming. If they are so crowded, add another box. This point in time, you add another box. So, um, and so forth, you can read the rest of it. Um, in November and December, there is a do not mess with the hives unless it is critical. Food must be there. If you must open, it has to be brief and quick and do what you have to do and then close. They don't take the cold even for a short period of time very well. So that answers, kind of answers the question about the person who asked a beekeeping calendar. Attend beekeeper meetings, those are the best. Also, there are some very nice articles online about the beekeeping calendar. You have to find one that uh, corresponds with where you live because the beekeeping calendar for something, somebody in Kentucky or Florida will be different from somebody in Michigan, for instance. Another person talked about swarming. How do we prevent swarming? And the thing about swarming is to keep an eye on the developing colony there. If you pull out a frame, as shown in the top picture there, and find those cells at the bottom there, which are queen cells, that's an indicator for swarming about to happen. And there are few things, one or two things you can do. You can add supers. You can start adding more super so that the enlarging colony is getting more popular, have a place to go so that when they are crowded, they're not overcrowded. You're stopping the overcrowding by adding a super. You're adding more room. On the other hand, you can split the hive. Again, this is something that's a whole class type thing, but the cartoon down there is showing a, a main hive right there and a new hive. And all we have done is take some frames from the main hive. The, the, so the main frames would be these ones that have solid lines. And all we did was take a few of the main solid, you know, the, the frames that have solid lines from there and put them up in the new hive. 
And we've made sure that the new frames or the old, fr the frames that we've borrowed from the old hive or the main hive, one has pollen, one has open brood, one is cupped brood about to hatch, and the other one has honey, pollen and honey, of course, that's for food, and that the new frames are in there. And then you introduce a queen or let the new colony there make their own queen. Meanwhile, the old, the main hive, continues to grow uh, because you introduce some new friends as well. That is splitting a hive and that's one method of doing it. There are other methods of splitting the hive and people multiply the number of colonies they have quite a bit using this method is cheaper, but you have to wait longer now before you get the colony uh, in full swing. James? Yes, go ahead. Um about swarming mm -hmm. this is the season from may until about mid-july is the height of the season so we're trying very hard right now to prevent our bees from swarming until we can split them splitting them is doing um, artificially swarming in other words what they want to do is take off half the half the bees want to take off and start a new hive so instead we sort of preempt that by splitting them into two hives yes artificially and that way we're hoping that we satisfy their need for um, uh, reproduction, for splitting themselves into two hives. Yes, thank, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so those of you already having bees, colonies, start watching out for monitoring for the swarm cells. Okay. So that's the end of the presentation, and I'm sure there must be some questions, and we are here for another so many minutes. Please ask any questions. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat box, maybe? I can't see the chat box. Let me see what I have here. Um, I have one that says, what is a super? Oh, okay. Super, okay. Let me go back to... The super is in a box that you put above the main hive, bo hive box, way down there. Can I, can I um, yes, please. Um, chime in? Um, we call them supers. I think it comes from the word superior, and it means the box that's up above the brood nest. So a honey super is really just a way of saying a box, a honey, a box that contains honey. Thanks. So yeah, we're back to the diagram there. So yeah, um, like I said earlier on, the deep super, that's where the queen is doing her thing, laying eggs, and she's excluded from going to the superior or the super that is above that box because there you just want honey. And as you can see, it is shallower than the bottom box there, the deep super. It is shallower because with honey, it will probably be 60 pounds or 70 and lifting that, of course, is heavy. Beekeepers don't want to be lifting 100 and something pounds, so they made them smaller. So super is just above the main box. And you can have as many as you want, but the limit is, of course, if you start having too many of them, you need a ladder to go up there to pick it off and the weight and all that. You have to consider all those things. Okay. I believe that's the only question that we have in the box. Again, if you have any questions for the speakers, please enter it into the chat box. We'll give it another few seconds here, see if anybody has any others. And and uh, you can take our, if everybody got the handout, that's fine. You already got our. That will be sent when I send the link. 
Okay, so our emails are right here, and you can also call. Well, yes, the email is better. So I don't see any of the questions coming in. So I'd like to thank our presenters, James Theory and Maggie Watcher, for sharing their information and knowledge on beekeeping. If you have any questions, please contact them directly. And I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us on this webinar. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.